minute. So here's the reality, okay? We are in a recession, not officially per se, but we As your all's trusted advisor, I think it's part of my job to help you make sense of this ever-changing business marketplace and our cultural landscape and try to offer you fully vetted guidance on how to adapt and what vital moves to make now, importantly, take advantage of these new emerging opportunities. So what I will cover over the next 10 to 15 minutes is a distillation of hundreds of hours of conversations, expert commentary review, and analysis to distill down for you here in about 10 to 15 minutes, okay? So uh, you're kind of shortcutting a lot of time and energy that I spent to get what it is that I'm gonna give you here in, in, in 10, 15 minutes. So here's the reality, okay? We are in a recession. Not officially per se, but we likely will be in one in a quarter or two, if not sooner. In, in talks with Michael Harnett, the uh, chief investment strategist of Bank of America, he said, we're in a technical recession, but just don't realize it yet. And there are more shocks to the system to come. So we're watching this whole thing play out in real time right now. Since the beginning of the year, the stock market has cratered into a bear market. The S&P has fallen for 10 out of 11 weeks straight. Just last week, the S&P posted its worst week since March of 2020. The NASDAQ is down 30%. But what gets lost in that number is if you take out a half dozen high flyers, the median stock is down over 70%. Many are down 80 to 90%. The uh, stock market darlings have also been gut punched year to date. Apple's down 25%, Google's down 23%, Amazon's down 35%, Tesla's down 41%, Facebook's down 50%, Netflix is down 70%. And since panic selling has ensued, the crypto market's been smoked. It's dropped nearly two thirds from its high a year ago. The double B bond index is 50% basis points lower than the yield on a new treasury bond. That's never happened before in the history of the market. That means that trillions of dollars in longer dated bonds were issued with low interest rates. And now with interest rates hiking up, it's creating massive volatility in the credit markets. Startup valuations for companies have plummeted. The credit markets are all but frozen. Inflation has hit a new 40 year high of 8.58%. Gas prices increased 48% to hit an all-time record high last week. And now the labor market is getting hit. Tons of companies are rescinding job offers. You saw how Coinbase cut 20% of its workforce. Because over the last two years, their expenses went from $300 million a year to over $2 billion. Peloton went from $300 million in expenses to over a $1 billion. So what happened to these companies is between 2019 and 21, uh, their staffing costs and labor cost for these tech companies skyrocketed up three to four times. Why? Because their theory was, if you just grow the top line revenue, valuation goes up and you get a multiple return in the market. So it almost didn't matter how much your expenses were, you could multiply them in the public markets. Well, that is over. And now these companies have to transition to profitability. So they're dumping all that excess labor market back on to the market in massive bulk chunks. So here's the bottom line to summarize how significant this is. Since the start of this year, okay, five months worth of reporting, $35 trillion in global market value has been destroyed. To give you a sense of that number, that's 14% of all global wealth destroyed in basically five months. So for reference, in 2008, when we went through the cataclysmic shock that shook the entire global banking infrastructure, 19% of the world's global wealth was destroyed. So at 14%, we are quickly approaching the same market of market correction and value destruction. Now, I know that, that, that all this sounds horrifying, so let me give you this context, okay? Most all that value and wealth that's been destroyed over the last five months was gained since COVID. The United States government printed $6 trillion uh, new dollars. More was printed in a single month than our entire 200 plus year history. And to give that $6 trillion context during the 2008 crisis to bail out all the banks and subsidize insurance rates, the US printed $800 billion compared to the six trillion during COVID. So four trillion of that was distributed in stimulus checks combined with zero interest rates and the market got flooded with money. Now that money was meant to stimulate the economy. The idea is when you release capital from a central bank, the capital is supposed to make its way into productive assets, meaning businesses that can employ people, that can create products, that are products that people wanna consume and so forth. But instead, because COVID was still rampant and people were still locked at home, a lot of that capital flowed into financial assets and grossly 
overinflated the value of those assets, the value of stocks and these meme stocks that we saw and NFTs and the value of crypto, et cetera. So when the lockdowns subsided and people finally felt released, we went from this COVID standstill to, oh my God, we can travel, we can go places, we can buy stuff. So with this stimulus money in people's hot little hands and all that artificially inflated sense of asset wealth and zero interest rates to lever up those assets even more, people started spending money with reckless abandon on travel and houses and cars and luxury goods of all kinds. And it seemed that no matter what it is that you bought or you invested in, it just kept going up and up and up, sending inflation surging. Oh, and in the meantime, they quit their jobs. And that only added gasoline to the supply side fire. Now, when interest rates got hiked up, suddenly a giant Dyson vacuum cleaner came out. And all that money is getting sucked back out of the system and fast. And it's still happening right now. For as fast as the money got pumped into the system is as fast as it's being sucked out. It's like having a, a balloon and the balloon was blown up over the last two years and nobody tied it off. And then we let go of the balloon and now all the air is coming out. Something most people don't understand is the stock market is not a lead indicator. It's a lag indicator and it's much further down the river than most people know. I want to explain this to you because as the old axiom goes, there are but three kinds of people. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happening and those who wonder what happened when it's over. But I think there's a fourth person and that's the person who anticipates what's coming, takes action before it does. And that is what I'm here to help you do. Here are the half dozen dominoes and how they line up in the economy. And this is from my perspective. Okay. And I think that this will uh, maybe help you understand what's happening here and what causes what. So picture these six dominoes, one affecting the other, other, you have capital, business growth, jobs, stock market, consumer sentiment, real estate. So here's how it works. Business growth requires access to capital. That is why the Fed rate hikes have such a downriver impact on the economy. The access, the cost of capital, the liquidity of capital is the first domino. Capital affects the second domino, which is business growth. And depending on the growth or decline of a business, that determines if a business is hiring or laying off. And since most companies are private, the best public measurement for business growth are unemployment numbers. So job numbers are the third domino. And that is why the stock market, domino number four, is so fixated on job numbers. Domino number three, it is because it's the closest indicator to whether capitalism slash the economy is expanding or contracting. The stock market is a lagging indicator to what's real, what's really happening in real time. And then the stock market becomes a lead indicator to consumer sentiment domino number five. So the media bombards us with reports on company layoffs and the plummeting stock market and the cratering, cratering crypto market and consumers go, holy crap, everything is bad and fear sets in and spending slows. So it's important to know by the time we have a change in consumer sentiment, most everything has already happened. We are already way down the river. Any action that they take at that point is way too late. Then Finally, we see the effects in the real estate market, domino number six. It takes a little while for the lack of demand to have that supply accumulate and then sit there on the market for a bit. And here's why, because it takes a little while for sellers to sober up, to let go of the drunken value of last year and what their neighbors sold for in a very different market and drop their prices to meet the new reality. So right now we are in between domino number four and five, and we've been seeing the effects on the stock market and the financial markets. And I think much is to come still. And consumers are just starting to feel the burn. And with it, they are seeing, uh, we are seeing a massive spike in the amount of consumer debt. Another very worrying trend. People went an entire year not spending any money. So savings skyrocketed. The government sent out free money. People got liberated and they start spending like crazy. Inflation skyrocketed. Then stimulus tech checks stopped being sent out. Their paper stock and their crypto portfolios plummeted, but they got used to a certain lifestyle, a certain extremity of spending. And once they, and, and it's one that they didn't want to lose. So instead consumers are turning the plastic to cover the soaring costs of everything. The number was 60 billion of new consumer credit just last month, the highest level of increase in over a decade. Oh, and, and, and meanwhile, we're fighting a proxy war in the Ukraine against Russia to the tune of about $40 billion every month or so. So this, ladies and gentlemen of the <laughs> BMC VIP, this is the reality of where we are. I learned a long time ago, the hard way, that facts do not cease to exist just because you ignore them. But 
In all of this, please keep in mind, where there is chaos, there is opportunity. And, and that's a good one for your notes and your wisdom bank if you didn't write that down. Where there is chaos, there is opportunity. In downturns, there is a 90-10 uh, loser to winner fallout. It's been proven time and time again, cycle after cycle, that 90% of businesses stall, get hammered, or go bust, 90%. And at the same time, 10% boom. Microsoft started after a recession in the 70s. Apple's surge began after the 9-11 economic downturn. Netflix first introduced streaming service around the time of the Great uh, Recession, starting with zero subscribers. They had just topped a billion in revenue at the time. Now they have 222 million subscribers. They did 30 billion last year. Google and Amazon both came screaming out of the dot-com bust in 2000 and did so did hundreds of other world-changing companies. Uber, Spotify, Airbnb, uh, Square, and dozens of other next-gen technology companies were founded between or right in the middle of the greatest financial crisis to ever threaten America. Lego of all things, decided to expand into a global market during the 2008 recession. And by doing this, the company reached an all-time high profitability during a recession. So the difference maker here, ladies and gentlemen, between the 10% and the 90% and the key points that I want to help you with here is that there are three things that make the difference between whether you end up on the 90% side of the ledger or the 10% side. Number one is preparation. Number two is adaptation. And number three is innovation. And through continual updates and evolutions and advancements that I will make to our Business Masterclass curriculum and through many of the other new resources that I will design and develop for you as we go through all of this together, I will be guiding you all along the way through this volatile, but I will tell you, incredibly opportune period that we will experience over the next two to three years. But for right now, I offer you these three pieces of advice, okay? You're going to want to write these down. Here's number one. Protect the downside. Consider for yourself, what is the extreme bear case for your industry and for your business? And then with that, figure out how you can optimize for contribution margin, profitability, and cash flow. Watch your debt. Make sure that you are not over leveraged to the point where a bank or a creditor, creditor can call you on a note a note, one that can put you out of business, okay? And if you need a backstop, look to secure some additional capital to shore up your balance sheet, but you gotta do it quickly if you can because the credit markets are icy, icy, icy already. And stack your cash. You want liquid assets available. For security, yes, but most importantly, to buy valuable assets at fire sale prices. That is the easiest and fastest way to create wealth. Just ask Warren Buffett, just ask the best investors of all time, the best business operators of all time. You can see the next two to three years as the greatest wealth building opportunity of your lifetime if you take advantage. I'll give you an example. So in the early 2000s, the five-year-old online bookseller called Amazon.com sold $672 million of convertible bonds to shore up its financial position. One month later, the dot-com bubble burst, and more than half of all the digital startups went out of business over the next few years, including lots of Amazon's then rival in e-commerce. Had the bubble burst just a few weeks earlier, one of the most successful companies to have ever been might not be here today. It very well could have fallen victim to that recession. So once you have your downside protected, once you've got your defense in place, now it's time for offense. Grab market share, number two. Everybody else is going to contract, and that is when you need to expand. You know Buffett's axiom, right? Be fearful when others are greedy. That's what's been happening over the last two years. I can't believe what it is that I have witnessed. And be greedy when others are fearful, and that is coming, and it's coming hot and hard. Two things to not cut back on, okay? Be ready to write these down as well. Do not cut back on marketing. Double down on it. The noise of a hyper cluttered, cluttered market is about to lessen. And now is when you can stand out and you can gain your dominance. And when times are difficult and people are fearful, that is when your white knight strategy and your trusted advisor positioning will be most valuable to your client community. Because you are a BMC alumni, you are more uniquely equipped to dominate going into the next two to three years than anybody else in your space. Here's another good one for your, not, your notes. Pain equals money. The greater the pain, the more valuable a solution is. So as we enter into a stormy financial future, now is the time that you can be the most valuable to your client tribe if you step out and take the lead. Now hear me, you cannot just double down on the marketing that you might have been doing. 
Okay, most likely you're going to have to change your messaging to meet the mind and the worries and the fears and the needs of the market now and what is still coming. When times get tough and money gets tight and fear sets in, businesses, governments, households, and consumers do the same thing. They create two lists, the nice to have and the have to have. And they start cutting all the nice to haves out as a direct response to their revenue, their income, and their buying power shrinking. Which means you wanna reposition your messaging from being a nicety a vitamin, makes you feel good, no idea whether it's gonna do anything, to being a necessity, a painkiller. From something somebody wants to something somebody needs. Your message changes from making somebody's life better, enriching their future, to ending somebody's pain and problems now. And you learned how to do this at the Business Masterclass. And I will be expanding on that in future classes. Number three, learning to do more with less. Besides doubling down on marketing when everybody is contracting, this is the other contrarian move to make. The second thing you do not cut back on is the training and development of your team. Why? Because with it, you can do more with less. The greatest unrealized, underutilized asset in your business is the potential and the performance improvement of your people. Getting fewer people to output many times more. And you do that by one, skill building, leveling up their business knowledge and training and personal productivity. And two, doing it in alignment as a culture to build an environment and culture of growth and performance. That is why we encourage all of you to bring your key leadership with you to BMC and to take all your leaders with you through a year long journey through Hero's Journey together to use insane productivity to synchronize and harmonize everybody's daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly methods of operation and performance, to use Jumpstart coming out of the summer to re-engage, reignite your team, or at the start of the year to get your folks back into that energetic mo. Now, I'm not telling this to sell you anything. I'm telling you what I know works. I'm telling you this to advise you, to help you optimize and maximize your assets. Put it this way. If I had 150 employees, like friends of mine operating in the same industry at the same relative revenue, and the pendulum swing of the economy, that could wipe me out. The expense to revenue ratio would be too tight, leaving little margin of error or with a contraction and making me vulnerable. But because of the productivity and the marketing and the leadership training that I've invested in my team, my 20 people, not 150, produce the same outcome at much better margins. And because of it, not only can we sustain most any existential threat, but we are also much better positioned to take advantage of market opportunities that arise out of this shakeup. That is only possible now if you get more from less, more productive output per headcount. And that is only possible if you invest in the training and growth of your people and culture. So what I'm telling all of you here is this, as a nimble, an innovative entrepreneur, this is our time right now. The economy has been weird over the last two plus years for all the reasons that I have just described. But now things are gonna become real and that is when things are gonna get exciting, right? Re recessions are pressure cookers that rid the system of businesses failing to innovate in all the ways that you learn at BMC. Those who don't live up to the value that they are advertising, they become exposed quickly. Starting now and over the next two to few years, there is going to be some real opportunity on the growth and market capture side, if you know what you're doing and if you don't panic. And just know, I will be there for you all along the way. You can count on me to be your guide as we go through this exhilarating roller coaster ride. Your, pos your, your positive impact is how we make ours, so we're in this together. Be the exception.